Hello and welcome to Inclusive Spaces seminar series here at The Bartlett. I'm Sarah Shafi, Vice Dean of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at the Faculty of the Built Environment here at UCL and Associate Professor at the School of Architecture. And I will be hosting today's session. You're joining the October edition of Inclusive Spaces and the first event of this exciting academic year. For those who may have not joined us before, Inclusive Spaces is our monthly seminar led by the Bartlett's EDI group, where we showcase the latest research and ideas on all dimensions of diversity in the built environment. We're really thrilled to be opening up the 2022 and 2023 calendar with Inclusive Spaces everyday curriculums and everyday pedagogies. Before we begin, I'm afraid I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the session is going to be recorded and added to the Bartlett Faculty's YouTube channel, as well as the EDI website. We'll also forward the link to the recording to all registered attendees. So the format for today will be presentations for the first part of the session by Amy and Felicity, followed by a Q&A and an interactive poll before we end promptly at around 2 p.m. We do encourage you to submit questions to the speakers at any point during the session by clicking the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. For the interactive section of the session, we're going to use a platform called a Mentimeter. So if you have your phone with you, we're going to guide you through how to take part towards the end of the seminar. So please don't worry, it's really simple and easy to use and we'll guide you through uh, when we come to that section. So it's my pleasure to welcome Felicity Atek, founder of White Table Architects and director of professional practice at the Bartlett School of Architecture and Amy Culper, the new director at the Bartlett School of Architecture here in the Faculty of the Built Environment who together are going to explore the power of language in creating a more inclusive educational experience. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Felicity, our first speaker. Over to you, Felicity. Thanks, Sarah. I'm just going to share my screen and get ready. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I'll stop sharing. Uh, Sorry. Right, start again. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, here we go. So welcome everybody, and thank you so much for giving up your lunch break. As Sarah said, we'd like to talk about the language we use every day. And in fact, the title of this talk intentionally has one of my problem words. I find academic language in general, but particularly in relation to the subject we all are in, um, very problematic because we are clearly um, about and dealing with every day, everywhere and everyone. My talk will offer um, themes or um, thoughts on a possible beginning. And I will be reading out uh, the quote on each of the slides and then offering um, a thought or several thoughts um, on each one of them. So this one's by Sheila Robotham. Lumbering around ungainly like in borrowed concepts, which did not fit the shape we feel ourselves to be. To me, objectively, our course subjects and our methods and practices of teaching need to change and have needed to change for a long time. However, to effectively and with equity achieve the broadest aims of the education we're in, the profession must reflect society and allow the most diverse representation of the world. And I believe this starts with our everyday language. To paraphrase Mallory Blackman, the former children's laureate, I too, for example, want to look at the built environment that I love and feel that it reciprocates. 
um, that I exist and that I'm not invisible. I believe what we do in our everyday practice can bring about seismic change. Here's one by Alan Fletcher. Space is substance. Cezanne painted a model space. Giacometti sculpted by taking the fat of space. Malamé conceived poems with absences as well as words. Ralph Richardson asserted that acting lay in pauses. Isaac Stern described music as that little bit between each note, silences which give the form. The Japanese have a word ma for this interval, which gives shape to the whole. In the West, we have neither word nor term, a serious omission. Perhaps this should be a time for pausing, for considering ease before we get on with what we have to do. Angela Davis says, we have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, and we have to do it all the time. So my opinion is that we have to approach the everyday as if we change things, however small. But this, um, for those that can't um, look, see this properly, is a slide about thinking about the situation, but also being very aware of the reality that we, we are in. So this is a, a cartoon by Hellman showing a possible interaction on site for a woman architect. And I would say fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, we carry all of ourselves with us in our everyday environment. And we are part of the percentages of the general public that make up the statistics. We don't leave ourselves at the door like coats when we come into an academic setting. And I think this matters because one of the things that we need to do is I think use language more precisely every day. For example, understanding the difference between equality and diversity. Equality refers to providing equal opportunities to everyone and protecting people from being discriminated against. And the Equalities Act in 2010 is a good place to start. Diversity, however, refer refers to recognizing and respecting and valuing differences in people. Here's one by Baba. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. So who and what is valued in the built environment? Understanding is a key word in our education, especially in architecture. And here, I think it's useful if we can apply the universal design for learning principles as described by Ruth van Dyke of the Open University, which offers ways of describing students and staff differences and their implications for teaching and learning. These are some of what she says. For example, with women students, we need to add contributions of women and other cultures and recognize the value of different ways of knowing. We need to show that knowledge is constructed rather than transferred and learn to appreciate different ways of knowing such as emotions, insight and intuition. Students from different cultural backgrounds, stereotypes abound. We need to view students as indiv individuals who may or may not have the characteristics of the dominant culture performing, before forming expectations. Uh, different traditions, different learning styles that emphasize group cooperation, holistic thinking, valuing personal knowledge, the oral over the written, offer opportunities for students to draw on these to enrich the learning opportunities for all students. Now, learning and language 
go hand in hand, but language is a very sensitive issue. So we need to be careful about how we use our visuals, synonyms and examples whilst lecturing and teaching. We need to be sensitive to names of groups, ask students how they prefer to be addressed rather than assuming the use of a particular term. And we need to acknowledge that teaching styles expectations differ, differ across cultural backgrounds and work to accommodate different frames of references. Students bring to the classroom a knowledge of the achievements of their cultures, and we need to incorporate these in the curriculums and avoid making them the representation of a particular culture um, without asking. For example, calling a black or mixed heritage student to talk about Black Lives Matters puts the student in a sensitive position, even if you want student participation or involvement. Above all, I think we need to go away from Eric Williams's, Erica Williams's pedagogical stances and offer maybe what Dr. Joss Boyce has said about care and repair. We need to employ empathy, acknowledge misfits and difference, not as a problem, but a positive, um, taking into account character traits and describe embodied practice in our pedagogies. Harold Laswell says, politics is who gets what, when and how. And we need to widen participation every day to include consideration for the visually impaired, the hearing impaired, physical disability, dyslexia, also hidden disabilities such as asthma or Asperger's, mental health problems, gender and diversity, overseas students, age and maturity, and sexual orientation. I think the goal for me is to arrive at this um, cartoon representation where Disability Discrimination Act came in and there were words used such as handicapped, which then went to a disabled person. And now through this and inclusivity, um, we are seeing that it affects human beings and that we're all human beings. And so for me, the inclusive curriculum is where somebody said, where being different doesn't make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Felicity, um, for those thought provoking slides. Um, please do submit any questions you might have to Felicity or Amy later on in the Q&A section, and we will try to answer it towards the end of these conversations. So I'm not going to pass on any questions to you now, Felicity. I'm going to join uh, yourself and Amy together towards the end of the session. So I'm going to pass on to Amy for her segment of uh, these conversations. Over to you, Amy. Thanks so much, Sarah. Let me just share screen. Okay, so um, I'm so happy to be here today and I wanna thank Sara and Felicity um, for the invitation. Um, and I'm delighted that my first event as director uh, of the Bartlett is in the Inclusive Spaces series, as these are issues that, are, uh, that I care deeply about as an educator. So in everyday life and cultural theory and introduction, Ben Highmore describes everyday life as an arena of life that manages, for the most part, to avoid scrutiny. I'm interested in this notion of the everyday um, that uh, is somehow under our disciplinary radar. Um, and so I want to, um, using the term everydayness, uh, High Highmore alludes to the everyday as value and quality. And it's here that I want to locate um, my ruminations for today. So um, 
This is from Tina Compt, uh, her 2017 book, Listening to Images. What is the relationship between quiet and the quotidian? Each term references something assumed to go unspoken or unsaid, unremarked, unrecognized, or overlooked. They name practices that are pervasive and ever present, yet occluded by their seeming absence or erasure in repetition, routine, or internalization. Yet the quotidian is not equivalent to passive everyday acts, and quiet is not an absence of articulation or utterance. Quiet is a modality that surrounds or infuses sound with impact and affect, which creates the possibility for it to register as meaningful. At the same time, the quotidian must be understood as a practice rather than an act or action. It is a practice honed by the dispossessed in the struggle to create possibility within the constraints of everyday life. So uh, here I'm, I'm interested, I'm, I'm sharing an image from Tina Kamp's book by Martina Basagalupo um, called Gulu Real Art Studio. Um, and um, specifically interested in um, the questions that Tina Kamp raises in her book around examining the photographic archive um, uh, of the African diaspora. So in the book, she looks at 19th century ethnographic photographs um, from Africa, early 20th century um, mug shots from Cape Town and post-war passport photos um, from Birmingham, Alabama, uh, sorry, Birmingham, England. Um, and instead of looking at these doc documentary photos, she listens to them detecting in them what she calls the hum of refusal in small gestures of anti-colonialist defiance and difference. Um, and so I'm really interested in this notion of listening to images um, uh, as it applies to architectural education. Um, I had the opportunity in my last teaching position to teach an architectural history and theory course with a colleague who's an indigenous architect and um, architectural historian, and one of the things that she really worked uh, with me and the students on was the notion of listening for silences in the historical record. Um, and I think that Tina Compt is on to something like that um, in her work in this book. So um, this question of how we explore the silence of architecture's historical record in our curriculum and pedagogies, I think is what's at stake here. Um, I'm showing a diagram that many of you will be familiar with, a, a diagram of a typical crit. Um, it's paradoxical, I think, that for those of us who engage um, in spatial practice, in our pedagogical practice, that there are kinds of hierarchies of the um, critique that we don't really actively work on dismantling. And I wanted to share this uh, with a quote from Sarah Ahmed um, from her book, on being included um, that says, when history accumulates, certain ways of doing things seem natural. An institution takes shape as an effect of what has been automatic. Institutional talk is often about how we do things here, where the very claim of how does not need to be claimed. We might describe institutionalization as becoming background when being in the institution is to agree with what becomes background, or we can speculate that an agreement is how things recede. This becoming background creates a sense of ease and familiarity, an ease that can also take the form of incredulity at the naivete or ignorance of the newly arrived outsiders. The familiarity of the institution is a way of inhabiting the familiar. Institutionalization comes up for practitioners partly in their description of their new labor. Diversity work is hard because it can involve doing within institutions what would not otherwise be done by them. So um, here I'm interested in this idea of institutionalization becoming background and that, that part of the work I believe in um, pedagogy and, uh, and curriculum in the built environment is to begin to surface um, in education what has become background. Um, 
what has remained unexamined for too long. And this can be simple things like institutional practices, um, or it can be more complex things like pedagogical practices like the critique, and really trying to scrutinize them and understand what they are, what they communicate hierarchically um, uh, to our students, and whether or not this is the messaging um, that we want to, to send. Um, so the image that I'm showing you is an image from a recent exhibition at the Hayward Gallery called In the Black Fantastic, um, curated by Echo Ishan, who will be a guest here at the Bartlett in a few weeks. Um, and the image is by the artist Nick Cave. Um, and I'm pairing this with um, a passage from Donna Haraway's book, Staying with the Trouble. She writes, our task is to make trouble, to stir up potent response to devastating events, as well as to settle troubled waters and rebuild quiet places. Staying with the trouble insists on working, playing, and thinking in multi-species cosmopolitics in the face of the killing of entire ways of being on Earth that characterize the age cunningly called now and the place called here. Um, so I think that the ethics of care that Haraway describes um, in these passages and in her book avoids the pitfalls of what I would describe as being overly careful um, um, within this notion of the ethics of care and repair. Um, and what I like about it is that our task is both to make trouble and to settle troubled waters, um, which reminds me of um, the uh, late congressman and American civil rights activist, John Lewis, um, who coined the frame, uh, the phrase good trouble. And I think in architectural pedagogy and curriculum, um, we need to think around this idea of good trouble um, and what that means to our pedagogical practices. So um, in a TED talk that she gave in 2009, the um, writer Chimamanda Adichie um, talks about the single story. She writes, the single story creates stereotypes and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. And here I'm interested in this notion of how a multiplicity of stories might be important to education in the built environment. Um, and I'm sharing an example from um, uh, my friends, Emmanuel Abmasu and Jen Woods, architectural practice ADWO. And um, this, these are images from their website. And the conceit of their practice is that Emmanuel is um, originally from Addis Ababa and Jen from Melbourne. Um, and their practice is all about diasporic identities as being central to the design of cities. Um, and so their website is constructed of these diptychs in which they've designed their own entourage that are figures that reflect the global identities for whom they design um, and are interestingly always on the move because they believe that mobility is a critical part of diasporic identities. So um, in her book, Teaching Critical Thinking, Bell Hooks writes, for years, I was hesitant to share personal stories. I had been trained to believe that anyone who relied on a personal story as evidence upholding or affirming an idea could never really be a scholar and or an intellectual, according to dominator thinking via schools of higher learning. Telling a personal story to document or frame an argument was a sign that one was not dealing in hard facts, that one was not scientific enough. I'm grateful to have lived long enough to learn how much information we have been given and told was hard science or data was really a story, the interpretation of data and facts. And so I wanted to use this passage from Bell Hooks to transition from Chimamanda Adichie's idea of the danger of a single story 
um, to this notion of the um, how how it's possible to use personal stories and to um, I want to extend this to the idea of leveraging students leveraging their personal stories and their personal identities in in their design of the built environment. So I'm pairing this with some work by Amanda Williams called Colored Theory. Um, and in this series, um, Amanda Williams repainted and photographed eight vacated and condemned houses in the Englewood neighborhood in Chicago, um, drawing attention to the issue of underinvestment in African-American communities around the city. Um, and I think that Williams here is subverting abstraction, which often in architectural practice is used as a distancing mechanism um, and, and using it as a way to draw attention to socio-political systems that threaten collective cultural identities. Um, he, here's a passage from Audre Lorde's sister, outsider that I'm guessing many of you are familiar with. It is learning how to stand alone, unpopular and sometimes reviled, and how to make common cause with those others identified as outside the structure in order to define and seek a world in which we can all flourish. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Um, and here I'm interested in this notion of um, making differences our strengths. Um, and so I'm pairing this image with um, a, a, an image of Thomas Jefferson's house, um, Monticello, um, that he designed in 1772, and specifically this detail of the dumb waiter, which was used so that the slaves who were preparing the meals in the kitchen below would not be visible to, um, to his guests that he was entertaining. And this is critical, I think, because Jefferson was the third president of the United States. He's considered to be one of the founders of American democracy. But in this case, his um, participation in the aesthetics of the picturesque is being used specifically to suppress and render racial and socioeconomic differences invisible. So I think it's an important example of architecture, architecture in the built environment's ability to, uh, to make certain things invisible. And therefore, we also have the ability to make certain things visible as designers. Um, Zadie Smith uh, writes this about decolonizing. The dream of Franz Fanon was not the replacement of one unjust power with another unjust power. It was a revolutionary humanism, neither assimilationist nor supremacist, in which Manichaean lo logic of dominant submissive as it applies to people is finally and completely dismantled, and the right of every being to its dignity is recognized. That is decolonization. I really love this definition, her definition of decolonization. Um, and I'm pairing it with the cover of uh, Paul Carter's 2005 book, Parrot. Um, many of you may be familiar with Paul Carter's um, first book, The Road to Botany Bay, that he wrote in 1987, which was a kind of critical um, literature on colonization. Um, but in many ways, the his parrot book, um, I think, is the book that for me speaks most eloquently around issues of um, the importance of decolonization in our curriculum. Um, specifically, he calls attention to the parrot as a, um, an important figure um, with respect to the fact that it is um, it clearly exotic. Um, and he describes it as the perfect instrument of um, colonization because it simply repeats the language of the colonizer. And I think in a way that um, beyond the lessons that the book holds for efforts towards decolonizing the curriculum, which is something I believe we should be constantly um, examining and practicing, it also has been a cautionary tale about the inaccessibility um, of disciplinary language. So finally, um, the last 
quote that I want to share with you uh, from a BSA alumnus, Leslie Loco. I write to test ideas, but see students who prefer to speak, draw, perform. New languages are trying to emerge. There's a desire for a new kind of fluency. The school is the place that protects exploration. Fundamentally, the university's purpose is to produce new knowledge and new insights. And I'm pairing this, this quote with an image from um, uh, an alumnus from the Rhode Island School of Design or RISD where I last taught the painter Julie Mayrechu. Um, and I'm interested in her work. Um, this is a piece that she created for her retrospective at the Whitney a few years back. Um, and she uses in her work photographs um, in, in this particular piece, photographs of the condition in which migrant children separated from their families were being held at detention centers along the US-Mexico border. Um, and I, um, I think that this is uh, the way that she is engaged in image making, um, the ways that she's layering images of the built environment with more painterly um, kinds of images to me describes a new fluency um, and she's operating at the perimeter or the periphery or the porous edges of the discipline of painting and architecture and urbanism in order to um, create a kind of new fluency or new kind of language and i'm hoping because felicity prompted this conversation with a beautiful tony morrison quote about the tower of babel um, I hoped that this, this image and this thought might bring the conversation full circle um, with this question of new fluencies in relation to some of the questions that um, Felicity was posing about language. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm going to um, use a phrase by um, someone who cleverly in the question has put a reflection um, uh, to both of you for such inspiring reflections. Um, we have some questions um, that would be lovely to get to, as I know we're kind of short for time today to be able to still do the poll and the interactive segment of the session. So the first is from Lisa. And um, I'm going to pose it to Felicity, if that's okay. Amy, at any point in which you might want to answer, just unmute and I can come to you too. Um, but it reflects on gaps and their importance that you touched on, Felicity. So in your opinion, is it important to recognize and close those gaps to be more inclusive? Or is it important to leave the gaps for a more organic growth uh, to fill them as society? and politics allows? So it's a really amazing question. Wow, um, it, it is amazing because ease and um, pause is actually one of my um, research topics. Uh, and I think both are important and that is the, the reason why I think it's a really missing bit of our curriculums and our pedagogy. Because, I mean, it's known or acknowledged that pauses and gaps and ease are what allow innovation, for example. But, but you're equally right, Lisa, it's, it's, there are gaps, even metaphorically or verbally, in what we, we provide now, which we will need to fill. Gaps of people missing, of an acknowledgement of vertical and horizontal inequalities. I mean, those all need to come into our teaching uh, and our way of um, learning but also yes both I suppose is what the the simple answer to that is but a really um, great question thank you brilliant thank you um, I'm gonna move on to a question for Amy um, and that's from Sabina uh, Andron um, are there ways in which we could set uh, out assessment strategy for history and theory teaching. So it's related to history and theory, but I guess it could be appropriate to other um, streams of teaching, which is constrained to text to a lesser extent and allows more and multiple languages and formats while still meeting the outcomes of what students need to accomplish. 
Wow, that's a fantastic question. Thank you, Sabina. Um, it, and also really near and dear to my heart as an educator, um, because uh, I think that much of my work in history and theory that um, to date, which has been inspired by many colleagues um, doing history theory and design research uh, here at the Bartlett, has been interested in trying to find those different kinds of fluency, has been interested in um, the stakes of, let's say, visual argument and how we teach students to produce visual argumentation. And I think fundamentally, um, relative to the conversation we're having today, it's more inclusive um, because um, students who choose to study architecture or other disciplines in the built environment are often visual thinkers. Um, and so I do believe that there's a way to pair image and text to um, teach strategies around um, visual argumentation that that are rigorous and that can be um, it, it can be seen as valuable to um, accrediting bodies. So yes, I think so. And thank you for that great question. And I guess the challenge is how can we each take that on and look at alternatives? Exactly. Um, we have one that's also related to you touched upon within that diagram, the notion of the crit. Um, and for anyone that's joining us within the built environment that might not know what we're referring to when we use the term crit, a critique uh, in which students or staff may uh, put up their work and have a panel um, of individuals look and review and offer commentary to it. So um, the question, I guess, would be open to both. How can we transform the traditional and institutional crit to be more within a framework of care and also more accessible? Felicity, do you do you want to take this? Shall I? <laughs> You're unmuted, Felicity. So she's assuming. <laughs> okay. Sorry. No. Um, I, I maybe I would. Um, I thank you. I think it's a terrific question, and um, maybe I would answer um, with the, the work of of one of my colleagues um, at RISD, Carlos Medellin, who did a, um, who was really interested, he came from a background of uh, restorative justice in Bogota, Colombia. And um, as many of you know, a big element of restorative justice is to do with listening um, and exercise, some, something that we don't always see happening in the situation of the critique. And so he proposed this model that he called story tables. Um, he had a lot of first generation um, uh, uh, college students in his studio cohort. And he proposed this idea of utilizing um, Zoom during the pandemic to bring in global architects to have a different kind of conversation with students around their work. So it was um, two students paired with one architect and the student would students would share their work. Um, but the session would then transform into a mentoring session about how the architects entered um, the profession and mentoring students to start to understand how to take those first opportunities. So it was a beautiful kind of shift in both the problematic dynamic that I think that diagram I was showing, um, you know, the student with their back up against the wall facing a row of critics, and it made the critical feedback more um, fluid and personal, and, and it paired it with um, feedback about professional development um, in the future and hopefully made uh, networks for students um, when they did graduate to be able to help them um, get placements and find, find jobs after they finish their degrees. Brilliant. Um We've got so many other questions. I wonder, Felicity, if I can hold you on answering that one and, and ask a different one so we can get through a few more, because I think we could probably do one more before we go to the poll, if that's OK. Um, it's a rather long one, uh, Felicity, so do bear with me. Um, 
and it's from Jamie, who look, uh, who's um, asking a question on your reflections on culture's approach to language and space. So, for example, Japanese ma um, is space um, and our own absence of the word uh, like this, for example, it exists. Um, so by looking at the same differences in these cultures like Japan, uh, we might learn uh, to approach people with kindness and ultimately be more inclusive as a society. So to kind of look at your reflections on that um, statement by Jamie, and I wonder how we could do that more. I mean, I think it begins with um, an interest in the individual in a, in a weird way, um, not to assume that, you know, we can stereotype or group or, but to really, I think, look at, say, a cohort of students and really understand who they are and bring in a per something personal about them um, for the whole, including the, the um, tutor, we, we share something personal. Uh, and I think that develops empathy. And in empathy, then, we're able to look at all these inputs as positives rather than negatives, because we're able to relate to other people as human primarily. And I think in that, our physicality as people really matters. And for example, just a quick reflection on that crit position. I would say that if everybody sat down on the floor as my culture does most of the time to discuss, it would be a completely different uh, environment and a completely different reflection on that work. Or conversely, I've been to um, reviews where we're not reviewing an individual's work, we're reviewing an individual's idea. And that is a very fundamental difference. And we don't have to pick at what they've done, but we're, we're talking more around the idea. So I think it's um, caring <laughs> and caring particularly uh, and specifically about each person that comes through the door. Brilliant, great answer, Felicity. Um, we're gonna to move to the interactive section. I know there's lots more questions in the chat. Maybe if we finish that early, we can come back to a few more. Um, so do bear with us. We could also get hold of all of these questions and maybe respond to you um, after the session, because we know that we have to finish promptly at two. Um, so we're gonna to move to the interactive session of, of the event. And we hope that you all have a phone uh nearby if not um you can use your computer in order to access we're going to use something called menti.com so you can scan the qr code or go to www.menti.com and if you scan the qr code you'll go directly in if you go to www.menti.com it will ask you to enter a code and the code is 68017924. So I'm gonna hold on this uh, slide for just a couple of seconds to make sure everyone is able to log in and I'll do the same so I can see how long it might actually take. Great. So you should all um, now see a screen in front of you that says inclusive spaces, everyday curriculums, everyday pedagogies. So if we move to the next slide and let's hope we still have some participants with us that can do that. Great. So we have a series of questions or statements that Believe me, the answer, there is no right or wrong answer. It is anonymously submitted, so don't worry about it. Just submit whatever it is that you feel in relation to the statements we're putting. And what we'll do is at the end of the session, we will share the outcomes of these slides with you. So for the first one, what are the absent but essential ingredients missing from our current everyday approach to the built environment education? So whatever your thoughts are, place those within there. So 
So we can see lots coming up for informal settlements, communication and acknowledgement, which I think a lot of people can resonate with. The normality of failure and underperformance. Accepting failure as a learning experience. Culture, joy, reflection. I think that's a really, really valid one. You know, something that's really absent in, in a lot of what we do is time to reflect and space to reflect. Ease of pace and expectation. Monitoring, there was a really great one if we go, oh gosh, there's lots. Um, so you can continue to slide down. I can see there's lots that we need to get through. Safe space, financial stability, considering all ages in design, time to think. Again, going back to this idea of being able to have space to reflect and time to reflect. Accepting failure as vulnerable. <laughs> as valuable, consistency, constantly goalposting, empathy, ethics. I'm very curious, what did you put down, Amy and Felicity? <laughs> uh, I, I like the, the two responses that talked about failure. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I think that it's something we talk a lot about in radical and experimental pedagogy around the built environment, um, but often institutionally, um, we're not equipped to deal with it because um, if, if students experience failure, it's hard to recoup the um, re recoup their status or their standing after that. So I that's something that I think a lot about because I do think that um, we, we want to um, encourage students to take risks, um, but that we need to provide the institutional infrastructure that actually supports risk taking and doesn't penalize it. Yeah. I think reappraising success is a really good one, actually. Um, and I think just in the profession, the built environment that goes across the board, really, uh, particularly in this climate and day and age that we're in. Yeah, I think that's one of those, again, time to reflect, to be able to reevaluate what success is and what it means to you and what it begins to look like. Um, pedagogies of the oppressed. It's a fantastic, some really amazing um, comments coming through. We will share these with everyone that's taken part in the event. Um, uh so thank you for sharing those with us shall we move to the second um slide okay so on the reverse what words should we ban from our curriculum we've got one in the title uh moving forward from today so what words would you suggest that you may ban from your everyday curriculum concept <laughs> success competition ugly portfolio conclusion third word critic it's quite hard to read these because they keep moving around so wrong standard is a pretty good word to buy yes bullshit Bad, Mark. I think Mark is a, is, is a very good one. Somebody has written curriculum. 
vulnerable, mm -hmm. brilliant, significant. Explore. Mm. Fantastic. Shall we move to the next slide? We have two more, so still bear with us. So what currently sits under our academic radar that could be brought into our everyday curriculum? So what do you think that Amy touched on this again in, in her presentation. What do you feel sits under the radar that you would like to be brought into the forefront or as part of the conversation in your everyday curriculum? Financial considerations. Interesting. Philosophy, inclusion of lived experience. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you both touched on. Um, empathy. Mm -hmm. Print costs. Circular economy. Real world issues. Yeah. Real world, real world projects also. Yes, very, very valid. Threshold concepts. Cooperation with areas. Unrealistic expectations regarding workload. Good one. And then somebody else has written something on real world as well. Architecture schools need to introduce real world projects. Some schools leave students ill-equipped for the real world and the challenges that they will face and the projects that they will really go on to do. Resource and raw material shortages. Dream. I like the change in academia to a business model. I think that's yeah. something that's on a lot of people's minds these yeah. days. The encouragement to have a life outside of architecture. Detailing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Should we move on to our last slide before the close of the session? What is the one thing you are going to adopt in your everyday practice? Could be anything at all, big or small. So we have Compassion, individual compassion, kindness, truth, care, boundaries, care more. A couple about listening. Attentiveness. Mm. Getting better at names. Finding the missing voices, that's a nice one. Yes. Brilliant. Well, we have one minute to go. So um, that concludes our session for today. Um, thank you, Alma, who's working behind the scenes, sharing these screens for us. Um, 
I have to say a very, very special thank you um, to Felicity and Amy for joining us at somewhat short notice. Um, I also really want to thank the faculty comms team, Alma, who's working behind the scene and Liz for helping bring together this session, but also future events that are happening within Inclusive Spaces. Um, so Inclusive Spaces is gonna be back on Wednesday, the 16th of November. So in four weeks time with religious infrastructures in the city with the amazing Ala Shahabi, um, who's our new senior research fellow in EDI at the Bartlett and Saeed Mah. Hatir, uh, who's a PhD candidate at DPU. So please do join them and sign up for the thought provoking online panel discussion that explores interconnections between public space and personal faith on the occasion of Islamophobia Awareness Month. Um, sign up details should be in the chat, so do look out for them, but you can also find them on our EDI website of Inclusive Spaces. Um, we hope to see you there. Um, until then, stay safe, stay well, and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, everyone.